that uh, there are things that get in the way, however. We want to be committed to Christ. We want to be committed to God. But sometimes there are some things that, that hinder us from, from being committed. And we were honest. We identified some things in our lives. And we're aware of those things. And we want to take the right course to make sure that we can be committed to the incomparable Christ that we studied about on Sunday morning from the book of Colossians, the one we ought to be devoted to. On Sunday night, we painted a picture of the Christ-committed life. We used Philippians chapter 1 as our text, and we looked at the life of the Apostle Paul as one who was committed not only to others and the advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but he was also committed to his goal. He wanted to honor, he wanted to magnify he wanted to exalt Christ in his body. And so that's something we all agree that we need to take part in. Last night, we examined a group of people who ought to have been committed to God, but they were not. We studied from the book of Hosea. And here you had a group of God's people who should have been committed, but they were not. And we asked the question, what happens when we're not committed to God? And we took note that there will be a breakdown of moral behavior in our lives ingratitude will surface and will characterize us. We understand that whenever we are not committed to God, we're going to be committed to something else, and then we're going to reap what we have sown. Tonight, we want to continue this discussion about commitment to God, but we want to take this angle. And that is, is there any help for spiritually stalled lives? Maybe, maybe you're here this evening and you're, you're recognizing this is something that I need. Maybe I'm just stalled spiritually. Maybe I'm not as committed to God as I should be. Is there any help available for me? The answer, of course, is yes. There's help for spiritually stalled lives. Now, whenever I give the answer, you're going to be so disappointed in this answer. It's just going to be a major letdown for you. Because when I... <laughs> When I tell you what I'm going to talk about this evening, you're going to say, I know that. I need to know something else. I've tried this. It's like, this happens so often with people. We're struggling spiritually. What can I do? And we say, have you been praying? Brother Pat, you ever get the, give that answer? And you tell people, well, have you been praying? And they'll, they'll say, I know I ought to be praying. Or, or maybe we give the answer, you know what? Really what you need to do is just start reading your Bibles on a daily basis. Well, I know that. The answer that we're going to give this evening to this discussion about help for spiritually stalled lives, it's so basic, it's so fundamental. It's faith. That's the answer. If we want to be committed to God, if we want to be loyal and devoted to God, it comes down to our faith and how we exercise that faith. That's what we're going to be addressing this evening. But here's what we need to do. We need to dissect faith this evening. It's just not the standard answer. Well, have faith. And if you have faith, you're going to be committed to God and devoted and loyal to God. No, we have to dissect faith this evening. What is faith? What will faith do for me in my life? Is faith something that ought to be demonstrated in my life? And so we're really going to explore faith this evening. And as we begin this discussion about help for spiritually stalled lives. And as we talk about faith, we need to understand and we really need to have a good portrait about what faith is. And so I'm going to suggest to you in the first part of our study this evening just some basic concepts of faith. Maybe these are things we're familiar with. Maybe we need to be reintroduced to these concepts of faith. But let me suggest to you first of all this evening that faith is dependence upon God. Now, when you think of the individual who is committed to God, you're thinking of the individual who is depending upon God. It goes hand in hand. Maybe you're thinking in your life, well, you know what? There's been times I have not been committed to God as I should. I haven't been loyal to God as I should. I haven't been devoted to Him. Where was your dependence level at? Were you really depending upon God? That's why we say faith is key here. Faith is essential when we talk about being committed to God. And so our first really, if we want to call it a definition, let's just say faith is depending upon God. Whenever you think of individuals in the Scripture who were not stalled spiritually, who were really exercising their faith, were they depending upon God? Absolutely every single time. I'm reminded of David this evening. Think about David. Before he became really the king of Israel. 
Uh, he's been anointed king, but he's going out to this battlefield. And there's this Philistine giant on the battlefield. And do you remember what is said to David as he hears and as he listens to what's going on and what Goliath is saying? Goliath is cursing the armies of the living God and David asks the question, well, what are we doing about this? How, how can we stand here today and allow this individual to defy not only God but also the armies of the living God? And everybody on the scene tells David, you can't do what? You can't do anything about it. You're too young. You're not a soldier. You're inexperienced. You can't do anything about this. And so this record in 1 Samuel chapter 17 you have David experiencing this great degree of faith where he's depending upon God. You're right, David says, I can't do this. I'm not going out there depending upon self. I'm out there depending upon God. Now the question is, was David in this situation of being stalled spiritually? Not growing. Not making progress in the faith. Not being committed to God. When he goes out there and as he faces the giant, what is he? He's depending upon God. He's committed to God in that situation. That's the type of people we need to be. I think we'll all agree with ourselves this evening that when we experience these moments to where we're not growing as we should and we're not as committed as we ought to be, I think we can look back and say, you know what, my faith is playing a role here. Maybe I'm not depending upon God as I should. Let me offer you another example of faith, maybe a second definition, and that is faith is a firm persuasion, really a firm confidence in what God has said in His Word. It's not just depending upon God, but it's also relying upon God in His Word. Okay, God said this, therefore I believe it. Go to this passage in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 12 and verse 7. Listen to what God says to Abraham on this occasion. This is Genesis chapter 12, and verse 7. After this initial call to Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through verse 3, God tells Abraham something about the land that he's about to enter and that he is living in. Genesis 12 and verse 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. You read through Genesis chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, and onward, you're going to see Abraham in the land of Canaan. He's going to build an altar here. He's going to build an altar there. He's going to dig a well here. He's going to plant a tree there. What is Abraham doing? When he's building an altar, when he's digging a well, when he's planting a tree, what Abraham is doing is he's putting down roots. He's putting down roots in a land that he's a stranger in. But why is he doing that? He's doing that because God says, I'm going to give you what? I'm going to give your descendants this land. The question is, did Abraham believe that? And the answer is, yes, he did. Why? Because Abraham was firmly persuaded. He believed what God was telling him. He believed in God's Word. We see this all throughout the Scripture. By the time we get to the end of the book of Genesis... Abraham's descendants are not in the land of Canaan. Where are they? Well, they're in Egypt. God redeems them. He rescues them from Egypt. And He sends Moses with this message. Exodus chapter 6 and verse 8, God calls Moses to deliver these people from Egyptian bondage. And He says, I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you for a heritage I am Jehovah God. These people are redeemed. They're rescued from slavery. And they make their way to the promised land. And they send out these 12 spies to spy out the land that God promised to give them. And when they return from spying out the land, everybody, all the spies say, it's exactly as God said it would be. It is a land that flows in, with milk and honey. But you'll remember that Many of the spies said, it's right. We believe what God said about it, but we can't take it. However, Joshua and Caleb were different. Why were Joshua and Caleb different? Why did they stand out? They stood out because they believed what God said. God said, the land is yours. God said, I will give you this land. And that's what they believed. 
They had faith in God. They were relying in God's Word. Now think about this. When we're not where we ought to be spiritually, maybe in this spiritual stagnant place, we're not growing spiritually, we're not committed to God as we ought to be, how often are we depending upon God and how often are we trusting what God has said in His Word? And again, if we're honest with ourselves, we'll say, you know what, when I'm there spiritually in my low place, when I'm not growing, when I'm not being committed as I should, I'm not depending upon God. And I'm not going to God's Word and I'm not believing what He has told me. If we're honest with ourselves, we can all agree with that. That's what faith does. Faith helps us depend upon God. Faith helps us move in the direction of being committed to God. Faith helps us rely in what God has said in His Word. Here's a third definition of faith. Faith is not only believing in God's Word, not only depending upon God, but faith is aligning ourselves with what God is, with who He is, His standards, and then living our lives that way. And the Bible is filled with individuals like this. You remember the parents of John the Baptist. You have Zacharias and Elizabeth. And Luke records this about them in Luke chapter 1 and verse 6. Luke says that they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Here's a question. Were these parents, were these individuals going in the right direction spiritually? Walking in the ways of the Lord? Making progress in the faith? Of course they were. Why? It was because of their faith. They were aligning themselves with God and they were living their lives that way. Remember Simeon? This is Luke chapter 2 in verse 25. Simeon is referred to as a man who is righteous and devout. What about Job? Job chapter 1 in verse 1. He is perfect and upright. He is one that feared God and he's turning away from evil. Barnabas in Acts chapter 11 in verse 24. He is a good man. He is full of the Holy Spirit. And he is full of faith. You have an entire household. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 15, the house of Stephanus, where Paul writes that they have set themselves to minister unto the saints. Here you have individuals. Here you have entire households. And we could go on. King Hezekiah, Daniel. All of these individuals are great men and women of faith. But why were they great men and women of faith? It's because they were aligning themselves with God. They were aligning themselves with what God has said in His Word, and they were living that way. Now again, we're going to return to this question again and again this evening. When we're at that spiritual low point, when we're not as committed to God as we should be, are we actually aligning ourselves with God and then living that way? The answer is no. And that's why faith is so essential. That's why faith is the key. Faith is not just one of these throwaway answers. It's not just one of these stock answers that we go to and say, what can I do? Well, pray. Read the Bible. Study the Scripture. Be a person of faith. Those are not throwaway answers. That's exactly what we need to be doing. Faith is aligning ourselves with God and then living that way. And then let me suggest to you a fourth definition of faith, and that is Faith is surrendering our will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom. And that's hard, isn't it? This is where we get into trouble. Because we do not want to surrender our will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom. But what does faith demand? Faith demands that we do that. And again, in our spiritual low points, usually what we're doing is we're operating according to self, aren't we? We're doing things our ways instead of doing things God's way. You think about Old Testament Israel. Where were they when they were at their spiritual low point? I'm thinking maybe in the book of Judges. Every man was doing what? What was right in their own eyes. They were not surrendering their will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom. They were doing their their things their own way. And that's really what got them into all the trouble. I think of the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 7 and verse 8, when he speaks about this thorn in the flesh. Now, I have no idea what this thorn in the flesh is. Brother Pat will be available after services to answer your questions about the thorn in the flesh. I have no clue what this was. But here's what I do know. This was plaguing Paul. And Paul is praying to God 
Remove this from me. Remove this from me. Remove this from me. And God answers, my grace is what? My grace is sufficient. And then Paul says, okay. That's an example of Paul surrendering his will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom. And what would we say of Paul here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Was he in this spiritual lull? Was he not committed to God? No, he was growing. He was making progress in the faith. And the reason why is because he was surrendering his will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom. We think of the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. And as you study through the book of Habakkuk, it's very clear that Habakkuk is irritated at the beginning of his message. He does not understand the events that's going on in his nation. He sees all the wickedness amongst God's people. And he's crying out to God, God, how come you're allowing this wickedness to go unchecked? You're deaf to this. You're not listening to me. You're not doing anything about this. And then God speaks and God says, I am doing something about this. And Habakkuk is agitated and he's irritated. And then when he learns what God is going to do about this, that really sends him over the edge. God says, I'm going to use the Babylonians to punish my people. And then Habakkuk has this whole new series of questions. How can you use a people who are ungodly to punish your own people? And then God begins to speak about how the righteous will live by what? Faith. By the time you come to the end of the book of Habakkuk, there is a different Habakkuk that emerges. You have an individual who is content. He knows what's going to happen. He knows that the Babylonians are going to invade. And he knows what that means for his nation. He knows that cities will be destroyed. He knows that crops will be destroyed. He knows that the grapevine and the fig vine will be barren. But he says, even though that happens, I'm going to be content in God. What is that an example of? That is Habakkuk surrendering his will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom. And that's the type of people we ought to be. Faith is dependence upon God. Faith is having this firm persuasion, this confidence in what God has said in His Word. Faith is aligning ourselves with God and living that way. And then faith is surrendering our will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom. That will make a difference in our lives. That will help us to become more dependent upon God, more committed to Him, more loyal to Him, and devoted to Him. So can faith, let's just say I live that way. Let's just say tomorrow morning, Lord willing, if we wake up, we have the attitude, all right, today I'm going to depend upon God. And I'm going to firmly believe in what He has said in His Word. And I'm going to align myself with Him, and I'm going to live that way, and it's going to be His will, not my will. Will that make a difference in our lives? Spiritually, what do you think? Absolutely. It will make a difference in our lives. One of the ways we can kind of prove this is by looking at what happens when faith is absent, when it's removed from the picture. When these four definitions of faith, let's just take them out of the equation and see what happens when that's not present. And we can use the church at Corinth, for example. Now, Corinth had a lot of problems, didn't they? You've studied through the book of Corinthians, that first letter. And and Paul addresses a whole host of issues, a lot of problems in that church. They were divided. There were different loyalties. I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Paul. They were divided. Paul says you're carnal. He says you're immature. He goes on to say in chapter 5, he speaks about that immorality that is in the church. And not only do you have that issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that issue of immorality, but then the church is not doing anything about it. And that is a major problem, my friends, when the church, the local church, will not confront immorality. That's what's going on in Corinth. Lawsuits in chapter 6. General immorality at the end of chapter 6. Chapter 8 through chapter 11, you have some of the brethren were participating in eating meat sacrificed to idols, and that really showed a lack of concern for their brethren, and maybe even the possibility of some being led into idolatry. Chapter 11, verse 2 through verse 16, you have the refusal of some of these Corinthian women to show their subordination to Christ when praying and prophesying, and 
You have abuses of the Lord's Supper. You have some in chapter 15 who apparently are denying the resurrection. What's their problem? It's a faith problem, isn't it? Think about this. Were the Corinthians depending upon God? No. Were they firmly persuaded in what God has said in His Word? No, they weren't living that way. Were they aligning themselves with God and then living that way? No, not at all. There's immorality. Were they surrendering their will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom? They were not. And that's the reason why you have all of these issues in Corinth. Faith ought to have made a difference in the lives of these people. But what we're confronted with in 1 Corinthians, we're confronted with a group of people who are not growing spiritually, who are not committed to God, and the reason can be attributed to faith. It's all about faith. Faith will make a difference in our walk with the Lord. You've read these genealogies. You've studied them in detail. Hours and hours you read through the names. Nobody does that. (laughs) What about Genesis chapter 5? You had these descendants of Seth. Seth lived and died. Enosh lived and died. Kenan lived and died. Jared lived and died. Genesis 5 and verse 22 and verse 24. Enoch, what happened? He walked with God. Same thing is said about Noah in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9. Noah walked with God. What does that mean? I believe that means that here you have two individuals who are growing, who are committed to God. They were walking with God. They were aligning themselves with God. And they were living that way. And it made a difference in their lives. In the case of Enoch, what happened? God took them. In the case of Noah, what happened? He saved himself and his family through his obedience and through his faith. Faith will make a difference in our walk with the Lord. The reason why we're not committed, the reason why we're not making progress in the faith, it's a faith issue. Faith will make a difference in our worship, not just our walk, but in our worship. You know, we need to arrive one day, every one of us, as individuals need to come to this point to view worship as a great privilege. Isn't it a privilege to be able to worship our Creator? To be able to take time and to center our thoughts upon Him and to praise Him and to lift Him up and exalt Him and to thank Him for what He's done for us. We need to do that as individuals. We need to do that collectively together and we need to take that seriously, don't we? We need to be people like that. But faith will make a difference in our worship. We read about these people that the Hebrew writer addresses in Hebrews chapter 10, these people who are neglecting the assembling of themselves together. What's their problem? Have you ever wondered why? Why would you miss out on a chance to honor God? And especially when you read these passages like Isaiah chapter 6, these throne room passages. Or maybe Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5, where God is front and center. Why would we want to miss out on that? Really, isn't it a faith issue? Maybe we're not strong in the faith. Faith will make a difference in our worship. When we depend upon God, when we align ourselves with Him, when we believe in His Word, when we surrender our will and wisdom to His will and wisdom, I tell you, the the person that does that, they can't wait to worship God. Wake up in the morning. Acknowledge God in prayer. Acknowledge Him through reading Scripture. Acknowledge Him together with your family. Worship Him together. And then, of course, you have highlights like Sunday and Wednesday when we come together and we get to spend time with people who have that same attitude where we just can't wait to come together to worship God. Faith will make a difference in our attitude about worship. Faith will make a difference in our work. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. Already, we've talked about this verse in our studies together this week. Paul writes, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always abounding. Which means to be overflowing in the work of the Lord. Overflowing in the work of the Lord. How can we be overflowing in the work of the Lord? What does it take? It takes faith, doesn't it? Maybe think of a time in your life where you are not abounding in the work of the Lord. You're not growing spiritually. You're not being committed. Why? It goes back to faith. Faith will make a difference in our 
in our work, in our worship, in our walk with God. Faith will make a difference in our warfare with the devil. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through verse 18, Paul writes about the warfare that we have with the devil. But if we're full of faith, if we're dependent upon God, if we believe in what God has said in His Word, if we're aligning ourselves with Him, if we're surrendering our will and wisdom to His will and wisdom, then guess what's going to happen? We're going to be tempted. But in those moments of temptation, we can be able to say what? We can be able to say, no. We can be able to say, I'm devoted to God. I'm committed to God. I'm going to grow in the faith. I'm not going to succumb to temptation. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we adopt that mindset and that attitude, the sooner Satan will leave us. And so the need of the hour, my friends, the need tonight is to have men and women full of faith. Men and women who understand that the old man of sin has been put to death. That old man no longer calls the shots. Men and women who walk with the Lord, who worship the Lord, who work for the Lord, and who go to war against Satan. That's the need today. And I tell you, when men and women live like that, guess what you have? You have a committed group of Christians. And that's what we want to be. Can faith make a difference in our lives? The answer is yes, it can. As we depend upon God, rely upon what He said, firmly align ourselves with Him and surrender our will and wisdom to His will and wisdom. It's one thing to acknowledge that. It's a whole other issue to live that out, isn't it? And that's where some people have trouble with us just giving these stock answers. All right, I'm not growing. I'm not as committed as I should be. And we give the answer tonight. Well, faith. I understand that. Okay, I know that I ought to be a man or woman of faith. But my friends, that faith must be demonstrated. It's got to be demonstrated. Faith must be demonstrated in order to be well-pleasing to God. What is the testimony of James? As you read and study throughout James, what is the testimony of James? That in James chapter 2, faith without works is what? It's dead. It has to be demonstrated. What is the testimony of Hebrews 11? You have men and women of action. Abel did this. Moses did that. Abraham did this. Men and women who were active. They were not simply acknowledging, okay, faith is essential. Faith is the key here. What were they doing? They were actually living out their faith. What is the testimony of the Bible? What is the biblical record? You go from Eden to Sinai, and what did God expect of His people? Every single time, be men and women of faith. And you go from Sinai to the cross, and what has God expected? I want my people to be men and women of faith. I want them to demonstrate that faith. We studied from Hosea last night. And these people of God were not demonstrating the fact that they were men and women of faith. And that led to the breakdown in moral behavior. That allowed ingratitude to surface and to characterize these people. That allowed them to be committed to something else. And they suffered the consequences for that, didn't they? You go from the cross until the day our Lord returns. And what does God expect of His people? I want you to demonstrate your faith. God desires that we demonstrate our faith. Let's paint a picture this evening of an individual who does that. They depend upon God. They commit themselves to God's Word. God said it. I believe it. They align themselves with God and they live that way. And daily, and monthly, and yearly, they surrender their will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom. But it's not just a mental exercise. They're demonstrating that faith. It's making a difference in their life. What is that person? That person who is walking with God and worshiping God and they're working for God, and they're going to battle against the devil. What is that person? That's a person who's committed. And that's the people we want to be. We want to be people who are committed to God. What happens to this person who lives this way? 
Look at Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, you have three judgment scenes. The first part of Matthew chapter 25 concerns these foolish virgins. Sounds like they had a commitment issue. You have in chapter 25, verse 14 through verse 30, you have these individuals who were issued talents. But at the end of Matthew chapter 25, you have this third judgment scene. Listen to it in verse 31 beginning. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered all the nations and He will separate people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and ye gave me food. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to see me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the, the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels, for I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. We've read this to illustrate the fact that there are those who live exactly the way we've been talking about this week. These people who are blessed by the Lord, what type of people are they? These are the people who are committed to God. And because they're committed to God, they're like Paul that we studied about on Sunday night. They're committed to others. And they demonstrated that faith. And Jesus said, you're doing this to me. When you do it to them, you're doing it to me. But then on the other hand, we look at another group of people who were not committed to God. They were not committed to others. And of those, Jesus says, they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This tells us, my friends, just how important spiritual growth is. And it tells us just how important being committed to God is all about. You know, we're not spending just 20 minutes, 30 minutes here this evening. We're not spending this time just through some exercise. You're here and I'm here because we want to change our lives. And we want to bring glory and honor to God. And we want to be the type of people that God would have us to be. And we want to be people who can lift up each other and encourage one another. And there are those who are at times who are not going to be committed to God. And we can encourage people like that. And there's going to be times when we're not the people we ought to be. We're not the ones being committed to God. And guess what's going to happen? Our brethren are going to be there to encourage us to do that because the stakes are high. This is a matter of spending eternity with God or spending eternity out of His presence. That's how serious this is. And it's great to see familiar faces. And it's great to be able to meet new brethren. But my friends, if we leave here unchanged, it profits us nothing. And so no matter who we are this evening, no matter what your experience, no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been a Christian, this is an area we can all grow in.
we can be committed to God. Again, you may be here tonight and you're in this spiritual low point. You're not growing. You're stagnant. No growth. Maybe you're going in the opposite direction. What will help us? I told you you weren't going to like the answer. It's, it's faith. And this is something we all know. And here's the easy part about all of this. It's something we can do something about. No matter who you are, this is something we have control over. I can control whether or not I'm dependent upon God. And if I'm not dependent upon God, it's not your fault, it's not God's fault. Whose fault is it? It's my fault. I know we live in a society that likes to cast the blame. And we want to pin the blame on everyone else except for self. But if I'm not committed to God, and if I'm not growing as I should, it's not the local congregation's fault. It's not my family's fault. Whose fault is it? It's my fault. If I'm not firmly persuaded in what God has said in His Word, it's my fault. If I'm not aligning myself with God and then living that way, it's my fault. If I'm not surrendering my will and wisdom to God's will and wisdom, I can't blame the government. I can't blame the school system. I can only blame myself. So recognizing that, it's something we all have the power to change. So when we leave here tonight, let's leave here as individuals who are going to be committed to God, who will exercise faith, who will recognize just how pivotal, how essential faith is in all of this. And not just use faith as one of these throwaway words, but to really challenge ourselves to be men and women of what? Of faith. Can we do that? Can we do it together? We can. Lord willing, tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about raising our level of commitment. And then Thursday night, we're going to be talking about contagious commitment. Whenever you're committed to God, that's contagious. It can rub off on others. That's the people we want to be. If you're here this evening and you're not a Christian, I know these brethren here would love to study with you about how you can be a child of God. If you're ready to commit your life to Christ, you can do that by believing in Him, by repenting of your sins, by being buried with Him in baptism. You can be clothed with Christ and you can begin your life of commitment tonight. Maybe you're here as a child of God, as one who at one time pledged your loyalty, your commitment to Christ, but you haven't been growing as you should. Now's the day, now's the hour to change all of that. Let's encourage each other to do that so we can be the men and women God would have us to be. If we can help you in any way, let us know as we stand and as we sing together.